Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome back to part four of our rebuild of the uh, HANA Developer Open SAP course materials. Uh, to recap where, what we've covered so far, uh, we've built our project structure, we've done a basic test of it, we've created, a, uh, we've modeled, I should say, in the database, the uh, the common components that will be reused in, in different parts of our data model. And then we started uh, last week uh, really getting into the data modeling itself and creating all of our master data tables and, and views. And we left it last time. We were able to test uh, the master data, even from the OData service layer, uh, just using the CDS serve command uh, to quickly test and, and we were able to uh, view some of the data via the OData interface and, and saw examples of some of the cloud application programming model more advanced features like localized text and, and things like that. We were able to see the, uh, the automatic translation or, or, or the usage of, of the correct language version uh, based upon our logon language, it, even through the OData service without us having to do any kind of special logic or processing there. In today's episode, we want to pick up right where we left off and continue with our database level uh, modeling. Uh, but now we'll move into the transactional part of our model where we will, um, uh, we will create the purchase order header and purchase order item tables. So we'll return to our project in the Business Application Studio, pick up right where we left off, Remember, we were just having completed the master data portion of our data model, although we had to comment out a few references to the transactional tables because we haven't created those yet. But that's exactly where we're going to start now. We're going to create this uh, purchase order.cds in the same schema folder. And like before, I'm going to cut and paste some of this so you don't want to watch me type more than I have to, believe me. Uh, but we'll go through it a section at a time once again to uh, to be able to explain everything that we're doing and, and everything that we're using here as we go. Uh, so just like our master data, and in fact, let me go ahead and pull this up side by side here because we can see a lot of common things. Uh, but just like when we were building our master data model, uh, we have some using statements from SAP Common. Here we're going to use the currency again, the managed. Uh, don't have any temporal objects here. This is a transactional data, so it's, it's not going to have different versions at different points in time, like, like we have, uh, say, with the addresses, where somebody's address, they might move. Uh, so on a certain date, their address might be one thing, and, uh, and after that date, it would be a different address. And we're not going to use that feature here at the transactional level. Uh, but we are going to use the CUID for uh, for GUID-based keys once again. Um, we're also going to reference the Open SAP Common, and as you see here, we're going to reference the master data as well. So so we can create some associations from our transactional tables to our master data tables, and and once we complete this, then we'll be able to go back and put these references to uh, to purchase order back in the master data as well. Let's begin with the purchase order header. We'll start with the entity definition here. And let's look at what we have. First of all, entity headers. It is going to be a managed entity. So just like we saw the other day, we'll get the created, uh, created at, created uh, by, modified by, modified on, fields automatically added. And of course that will also space there um, just like we did the other day on some of our entities that had that in the master data level we'll add associations back to the employee uh, entity and that uh, allow us to be able to load details uh, from the uh, uh, from the employee not just the email address but uh, then we can load other details uh, along with the purchase order header that's useful we will have, just like we saw the other day, we're not going to use an association here because we want to be able to do a deep insert so uh, or, or deep update. So we're going to do a composition. 
so that when you create headers, you'll also be able to create items. And likewise, if we delete a header, then we want it to cascade that delete operation to all the uh, all the items of the same uh, same purchase order header key. So we will use the composition of many items. That's a little different because I think the other day when we did uh, like business partners to addresses, it was composition of one addresses. Here we're going to have composition of many items. Um, and you'll see here that it is a self-reference back to its uh, back to itself. Once you see uh, once we model the items, you'll you'll see how that works. We'll come back to that once they're both in here, and, and we'll be able to see it better. Um, we have a note ID, and that's not an interesting partner. Now this is an association, not a composition, so we never want to cascade the deletions. You know, when you delete the header. You're never going to delete the business partner as well. We're going to reference an existing business partner, so that is an, an association. So we'll only store the key to the business partner here. And then it'll, we can be able to fetch the rest of the details from the business partner entity itself. Then we have some statuses, lifecycle status, approval status, confirmation status. If you remember these, uh, they were in our common it was a enum. there if we look at that status t there you are it's an enum that gives us the different status values um so i have a default one on life cycle status well, that's not part of my enum <laughs> uh, so you now i get a little mismatch there in my uh in my example i don't think i want that to default to one i think i want that to default to uh new that would make uh would make a good bit more sense with there wouldn't it um yeah so the rest of this is pretty pretty much like what we've seen before repeats of the other columns it might be interesting to actually skip ahead now and let's define the item entity if we look at the items it's going to be uh CUID. Uh, we're also going to apply the abstract amount and quantity, also from our common. Oh, did I close my common? All right, put it right back. So if we look at that, if we look at the abstract amount, uh, uh, oh, actually, common amount. Yeah, so. That's our amount. Oh, there it is. There's abstract entity amount, which is automatically going to put currency, gross amount, net amount, tax amount in. And we have the same thing up here in the header. And if we look here at quantity, same thing in abstract entity, we'll automatically put quantity and quantity unit in together. Uh, you know, by using these abstract entities, we have a lot of consistency every time we use the same uh, logical data constructs, they'll be applied the same way. We could even come along and make changes centrally here to the abstract entity and then all the specific entities that, that reference that abstract entity or apply that abstract entity would all change uh, at once. So it's really a kind of, I know as soon as I start using terms from uh, object-oriented, uh, people sometimes freak out. They're like, no, CDS isn't object oriented, but but in a way, this is a form of inheritance. If you're more comfortable with the term reuse, um, but but either way, it, it's a way to centrally maintain something. Uh, so you, you get common application of it and one place to change it, and then it changes in all the all the referenced entities. The other thing that we see here, primarily, we've got association. So we got an association to headers. Uh, uh, named PO header, and that's how we also build our composition here back to the item composition of many items on item. Uh, so that's the name of the composition that will take us to items uh, dot PO header. That's the association back to headers. So it feels 
rather circular here, but it, it works out all neat and nice. And we're able to just say equals dollar sign self. Well, that's just saying whatever the key is here, that's what it's going to use is the key of the, of the composition. Uh, the association, also no specification field, so it's automatically going to be on the key as well. So that generated uh, ID based, uh, that's coming from the CUID aspect that we added to both the headers and the items, that's going to be used as, as the key here automatically. We don't have to define that. Product is a association to one uh, MD products, master products, and the rest of this pretty pretty straightforward stuff. So let's go ahead and save right there. All right, our base data model is actually in pretty good shape here. Now, just like we did with the master data and the common, uh, we want to go ahead and we want to add some annotations and following the best practice um, documentation of the uh, cloud application programming model. I'm not going to mix the annotations directly into the entity, but instead I'm going to come along and I'm going to add that. Whoa, I got a little more than I bargained for there. Come back to that. <laughs> uh, just a little cut and paste error. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say annotate headers with. So I keep the annotation separate just to make it cleaner for maintenance and reading. For the most part, once again, we're adding title description with uh, uh, separate language elements here from our i18n file. If you remember that, the i18n properties that we've loaded with a whole lot of descriptions. I only have an English version, but of course you could add other language versions here as well. Uh, for the most part, that's all we really want to talk about now. Like I said, later when we get into the UI portion, we'll come back. We did load some uh, some value list, although there's other annotations that we'll add later. I try to keep my annotations to just the data model level annotations inside here. And then the rest of the Fury annotations I put in a separate file. Usually I put it in the SRV folder along with the service layer. Some people will put it up in, in app, but I try not to mix it into the base data model. The one exception that you do see me making a couple times here is the common value list. Not a full value help specification, but if I know I'm gonna have some parameter mapping for in and out or, or additional display information, and I want that to be very consistently applied wherever this is used in my in my user interface. I might go ahead and add it here at the lower level. That is something that I've that I've done here, for instance, with the with the partner. I define the parameter uh, in and out, um, and uh, and also that I want to display the company name because the ID is a GUID. It's not going to mean a whole lot. But that's obviously the key that I need to get out of the value help. Really, what I want to show to the end user is the company name in the value help. Um, so I went ahead and built that in at this level rather than like a Fury annotation separate file because, like I said, I want to use that over and over again. Um, I did go ahead and set some common field controls. I know that the status fields are internally calculated, and no matter what part of the UI is, is uh, referencing them, I want them to always be read-only. Uh, so I've gone ahead and marked that uh, with a common field control annotation as well. Okay. So that is the annotations for the header. Uh, let's see here. Do we have some? Yeah, we have annotations for the item as well. Let's go ahead and bring those in. They're not terribly large. There's, And it's the same sort of thing here. Uh, mostly text descriptions, although once again, I did do some common value list with the value uh, parameter in and out and display only. Once again, the product ID is the internal key. That's going to be what I need to get in and out of any value help. 
but I want to be able to display the category and the name as well. So I'm, I'm already kind of building my value help. If you think back to the old ABOP terms, this would be like defining the, the search help object in the data dictionary layer, layer as you're modeling. And that's kind of my thought process here as well. I like to build, even though I haven't built my UI yet and I haven't seen how I'm going to use in the UI, I, I already know from a data model level what I want to get out in and out of, of any common value help uh, kind of scenarios. So I've gone ahead and I've modeled that into the lowest level of the annotations in the data model itself. Okay. Differing opinions probably on that. Some people would look at this and maybe say, well, that should really be in a separate annotation file, uh, a UI specific one. But to me, I really think of the value help, the common value list in this case, or other search criteria, uh, annotations being part of the data model. It's all about how you want to maintain things, though. There's, there's no, I don't think there's a strict right or wrong in, in that case. Now I'm going to come back up here to my header because I also have some views I want to put in here. So I've got one view for the header. So let's go ahead and bring that in. And I'm just defining a view, header view, as a select from headers. And you'll see what I'm doing here. What I've done is I've just created some con a convenience view uh, that maybe I want to use this at the database level and already expand some of the associations uh, or compositions. In this case, strictly the header, but I have expanded the created by employee to also show the first name, last name, and login name. So using that, that annotation, the partner, I've expanded the company name, the currency, um, I'm showing the currency code. So, you know, of course, from an OData level, it's very easy to follow the associations. But sometimes at the pure database level in, in SQL, we don't have access to that special association syntax to just do the dot and, and the name. But if we build views with those associations already expanded, then we can just select from those views and, and we've got easy access from the database level as well. That's, that's why I often build some of these... Uh, little helper views, if you will, uh, uh, of common ways that I'm going to access the data. And I've got some more views here for the item level. So let's put this first couple ones in here. Let's go down here. Oh, i got quite a few here, don't I? You know, and what this was is I was obviously porting over an existing application, and it had had views built up over the years. Some were even calculation views, but as I looked at them, I decided to rebuild them as as regular CDS views. I just uh, weren't taking, I wasn't taking advantage of any aggregation or or other complex functionality of the calculation view. So it was simpler to to rebuild it as, as a regular CDS view. Uh, so for instance, here I have at the item level, same sort of thing, just like a helper view that expands some of the common associations like the PO header partner, uh, product, product ID, currency, currency code, just makes it easy to, uh, to access that from the SQL level. I've got another view on the headers here. Uh, this is mostly item data though, but it comes in from, from the header level, but then it's got a lot of once again, uh, expanded association information like the product ID uh, from the product association at the item level. This one, um, the PO work list, was a complex view. You know, well, this goes way back in this data model. I, I built the PO work list uh, back on a 1.0 SPS4 or something, and there was a there was an older UI that that sat uh, that fed right off this PO work list, and and over the years I've used it in XSO data, and now we'll use it here from from uh, the cloud application programming model. Uh, but what you see here primarily is you know it combines and flattens data from both the header and the item level, so it allows us to do aggregation and filters from both header and and item data. Of course, the header data would be duplicated for each item, but depending upon your use case, that that's can be perfectly fine. Uh, but I'm using this as 
you know, to give alias names to the columns. And that's for backwards compatibility with how I was consuming this particular view in the past. Uh, maybe had a UI that was already expecting certain column names, uh, and I'm able to, to adjust and supply that backwards compatibility, not by changing my data model, allowing my data model to adapt to the, to the naming semantics that work best with a uh, cloud application programming model, but then just putting a view on top of that and, and, uh, uh, and using the as statement uh, to, to give us uh, specific, uh, specific targeted names there. Um, same thing here with the purchase order item view, uh, backwards compatibility to, to an existing view. Now, I've got a couple more views here. Let's go ahead. Let's bring in this last one. Here we are. And what I did here is these are consumption views. Not that that is a technical thing, but logically they're views built specifically for the user interface layer. And what I've done is because these views are specifically designed to be part of the user interface, I've gone ahead and built annotations and even UI annotations into this layer. So I've gone ahead and embedded inside this, uh, this uh, PO header consumption view annotations for value help and, and field group. Uh, so I'm even putting, um, that will allow it to be in a line item or, or a selection field group. So I'm really building up the, the Fury semantics here uh, for both the header and, and the item level. And once again, matter of personal preference somewhat, you can make the case that really these should be off in a separate Fury annotation definition file, a separate CDS in a different layer of the application. Uh, but I still... Um, I come from, uh, once again, this is a concept that kind of came from a different environment of uh, the idea of a consumption view or different layers of views where you might have a, an interface view, a base model view, a consumption view. I still like that approach of the separation of layers by different views and, and then adding semantics into each layer of the view. And I've simply followed that same design pattern here with the cloud application programming model. Um, no, no right or wrong, but wanted to demonstrate those different design patterns and how they can be put to use uh, in, this, uh, in this development environment as well. Okay, we've got our base purchase order and headers now in our data model. Let's just real quick do a CDS build just to make sure I haven't broken anything. Good, no errors. Uh, so that all, oh, of course there were no errors. We haven't linked it into our schema.cds yet. Yeah, I'm glad I did that. So let's add that using from. Purchase order. Save that. Now let's do a CDS build. Hopefully I still haven't broken anything, but now that would be a better test. Yep, there we are. That looks better. And I can see that it generated purchase orders in there. That's good. Let us now that we have the base model. I could build it into HANA, but let's let's go ahead and and uh, add just a couple other things real quick here. Let me bring my master data back over here. If you remember from the last episode, we had to comment out these references to the purchase order because it didn't exist yet. So let's run through here real quick and see, yes, it was some additional views that we had that referenced the purchase order. And real quickly, we can look at these views. What do we have here? We've got um, define view BP view as select from business partners. Oh, this is an interesting one because I'm using a mix in to add an association that didn't actually exist in the base data model. Because if we go back up and we look at business partners, there's of course no association to purchase orders. We wouldn't want that in our base model. But for the purposes of this particular view, we do want that because we wanna be able to show uh, business partner ID and then all the orders for a particular partner. And we can add that on the fly. We can add an association on the fly or, or really just for the purposes of this view without adding it to the base 
uh, data model, that's the whole purpose of the syntax of the mix-in. So that's what I wanted to demonstrate with that particular example. And then what we did is we built that as like a, uh, a base view, and then we're going to add things onto it. So we're going to define another view that selects from BP view, so the one that we started there with the association. It's got our basic structure of a purchase order ID and then our business partner ID and then all the purchase order information via orders. So that gives us access to the whole order uh, purchase order uh, entity. But now we can do things like uh, select BP ID orders uh, where life cycle equals new. Uh, we could go a step further here and say where orders lifecycle new um, as ID. Oh, we get the ID and the gross amount as well. And finally, we could even like chain these uh, using the association. We're going to say only give me the orders where the lifecycle is new and, and also all the items where the net amount is greater than 200, also give me the product ID and the net amount. So you see using this, uh, the syntax of CDS, that would be a very complex join condition if we had to build it by hand. In fact, we'll look at that join condition exactly what gets generated here in a minute once we, we build it in the database. You'll see just how complex all these relationships are inner join, outer join, the where conditions that have to be applied to, to the join. But it's so much easier to write it in the syntax. And I think it's it's much easier for a human mind to read this, this kind of flow, um, uh, much more logical to, uh, to read it this way than the syntax that we would have to use if this was built via join conditions. Um, I know there's one more view in here, wasn't there? that we yeah, that's not one more view that we commented out yes there's one more view right there and this is a similar situation we're creating a select from products um, but then uh, in products we're also selecting from purchase order items to get a sum uh, where the product ID. So, so what we're doing is for a particular product, we want to get the sum of all the gross amounts of all the items for that product ID. Uh, just showing you here, like at a uh, sub select uh, if inside the view, and then here we have a, another product example, but with a mix in very similar to the mix-in that we saw before. This time we're going to build a, an association on demand to the items, purchase order items view. It doesn't have to be to the base entities. We can also build associations to those views, those helper views that, that we built uh, earlier as, as well. And you see the same sort of thing here. Uh, I'll check real quick, but I think that was the only... Oh, no, there was one more view here at the end. I'll leave this one out. This is a view that's going to help us with our uh, product values view. Select from product view uh, because product view was one that we had referenced earlier that had the mix in. Now we're building on top of it because we're adding a sum uh, with a group by uh, so that we don't mix different, uh, different, currency, uh, different currency amounts. We're going to group by currency code. That way we don't add euros and and dollars together. Uh, one way to do summation without having to do a currency conversion is just uh, do a group by on the currency code so different currency currencies aren't summed together. So, so that's one uh, example there. Let's go ahead and save this. And the only other thing that we need to do is we have some sample data for this as well, which we'll go ahead and load. So what do we call this? We call, we created a folder. Folder orders and let's go ahead and import these I've already got them out here oh, I have to go find them sorry DB loads purchase orders and let's grab our header and item file CSV so we've got some uh, test data to start with and I think now our whole data model is in good shape. Let's do a CDS build again. 
There we are. No errors. So we are good to go. Okay, let's go ahead and build this into the database. So we already did a CDS build. It was successful. And now we can just go to our DB folder and do an MPN start. That's going to send all this wonderful new content into the database. There we are. All done. And database explorer. Open DBX. There we are. Let's go have a look at it and check it real quick. Reopen everything I was doing before. There we are. I'm going to remember to close out my tabs before I close the database explorer there. Well, first let's look at our two main tables and let's make sure the data in them looks okay. So we should have an open SAP purchase order headers. Let's go ahead and have a look at the data in it. Looks pretty good. Created at, created by, modified at, modified by, unique ID, gross amount, net amount, tax amount, node ID, various different statuses, currency codes, and a link to our partner ID. So yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, got a lot of euros in here, but I think I should have is all euros I thought I had some US dollars in here too but maybe not um, now let's look at our items Put data there we are. unique ID gross amount net amount tax amount quantity quantity unit so you see our our two um, Aspects being applied automatically to our data model. We have a delivery date, currency code. Oh yeah, lots of different currencies at the item level. Uh, link back to the purchase order header and the product key that we can use to follow that association there. So data looks good. Data looks uh, like it loaded correctly. Data model looks good. Um, maybe what might be interesting here as well is to look at some of our views. And, oh, what was a We had a really complex uh, master data view just come back over and find the name of it. Which one was that? Um, oh, it was the one with product subviews where we did the uh, yeah, that was farther up. Sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. There, this is the one we want. I want to look at this BP orders three view. So let's go ahead and we're in our views and it's not going to be in the localized section. It's going to be in the master data. What was that? That was called. BP orders three. There we are. Master data, BP orders three view. And if we look at the create statement on this, relatively simple until we get to the from statement. And then we've got left outer join on uh, criteria in there with a left outer join from the uh, so we start from the uh, BP view, left outer join on purchase order headers, as orders on, there's our filter criteria, and then a left outer join to the items, and then there's our other filter criteria, and then another left outer join going over to products, and the filter criteria that goes down to 
to that level or or the where uh, the on condition in the in that case so you see just how complex this uh this is when we do it as these nested um nested joins that's that's complex to read i think personally compared to that that this is much easier to read uh, much more compact certainly uh, much more logical in the flow and, and easier to consume um, than the uh, the complex join conditions um, but you know i don't know if we want to go ahead and look at yeah, you know, one other view here. If you go back to your purchase order view. You remember, I created um, created like this header view that expands some of the associations. So maybe let's look at that one. Let's see, header view. Let's see if that works now. It's gonna do a. It's gonna do a. it's case sensitive in, in the search evidently and let's go ahead and open the data for that one and what we see here is yes we have purchase order data but we've also expanded in place instead of just having the created by with the GUID we get the created by employee first name last name and login name as well and like i said all we've done is we've processed the association we've used the associations to build the view you know created by employee dot and then the attribute of the uh, uh, of the association target entity it avoids us having to write complex sql or in this case if we look at the create statement more join conditions uh, so instead of us having to select and, and write uh, the selects with the join conditions, now I can do a simple select from the view and, and get the expanded data automatically. Much more convenient, much easier to do. Uh, and, and the reason why, and while I'm building my data model, I often build several of these helper views to expand uh, common usage uh, association scenarios as well. So it would be good this time and close out all those other tabs so we've got pretty much our whole data model built out um, everything that we need to now build OData services and additional RESTful services and our Fiori UI and all the rest of our logic at the database or application server level all going to build upon what we have here today already we've got our tables our views uh, we've seen all kinds of associated logic that we're getting, the automatic filling in of the GUIDs, the enums, the validations applied by the asserts. All that is built in. A lot of that, though, is at the CDS level, the Cloud Application Programming Model level. So those things will only be applied when you access it via the OData services or the RESTful services of the uh, of uh, the cloud application programming model. What happens if you want to also support database level access? We want to do inserts and updates at the database level. One of the things that people find uh, confusing is we have these associations and they're going to act very much like um, referential integrity or, or constraints but they're only going to be applied at the application level. So if I'm doing an insert via OData, it will validate uh, the referential integrity that we've defined here in our data model by our uh, associations and compositions. But if I were to go directly at the database level and do an insert into one of these tables and bypass the cloud application programming model logic, that referential integrity would not be enforced. But that's not a problem because we are allowed to still do things at the HANA native database level, even things that interact with the generated objects of the cloud application programming model. And that's one of the great things about the, the cloud application programming model. It is opinionated. There's a lot of technical decisions made for you, but it's not a black box. You know, it's not like everything that it generates is, is hands off and you can never touch it, never interact with it uh, from other ways. It's, it's very much still open. 
And what I want to show you here is, is exactly this concept. But now what you're going to notice, we've been working at the root of the DB level. And that's where we built our CDS files and our data loads and everything that CDS build can compile into target content. And that compilation we have going into SRC Gen. But just like traditional non-cloud application programming model development, we can also put other database artifacts, other HDI-based artifacts in this SRC folder as well. And they'll all be built into the HANA database alongside the cloud application programming model generated objects. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just to group things and, and keep it all, all neat, uh, is I'm going to go ahead and create another folder here in my source. And I'm going to call it constraints. And this is where I'm going to put additional database level constraints. So let's create a file here named po constraint.hdb constraint. And once again, it's the file extension that's key here. HDB constraint. And you got to make sure that you spell the file extension right. Um, that's what's going to cause this to generate the correct kind of object and what I'm going to put in here is I'm going to tell it please create a constraint called PO constraint on open SAP purchase order headers with a foreign key to partner ID that references the open SAP MD business partners entity or table in this case on ID and on update cascade. And, and that will make sure that when I insert a record into purchase order headers, that I can't violate this, this foreign key relationship and put in a partner ID that doesn't exist in the business partner table. Now, the main difference here is we have to work not with the entity names because those are only known at the CDS level. We have to work with the corresponding generated table names. So it may mean going over to the database explorer and looking at the table name that was created by our entity. Although, you know, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward formula here. It's taking the namespace, it's taking the dots and converting them into underscores uh, and then the final entity name and everything's converted to, to uppercase. Uh, so you can you can kind of translate it yourself, but even by looking at the entity names. But you can all, of course always check in the database explorer to make sure. Now let's go ahead and add another constraint here. Header item dot hdb constraint, and let's put this one in. This is going to be a constraint on the purchase order items, uh, just pointing you back to the headers to make sure that you can't insert an item uh, that doesn't also belong in uh, with a key from, from the header. So creating a foreign key relationship there as well. So we don't need to do a CDS build again because these aren't artifacts that are going to be picked up by the CDS compiler. These are only seen by the HDI deployer. So all we have to do here is from our DB module, we'll run an NPN start uh, to deploy these into the database. And what we should see is that there were two new modified files that were picked up. It did see that they were constraints and it went ahead and deployed those as constraints into the database. So now, even if we do a direct insert into these tables, we're going to get the same kind of referential integrity that would be enforced by the cloud application programming model. It does mean that for some of these rules, if, you, if you're going to access them both directly at the SQL level and come in through the cloud application programming model, you might have to duplicate some of your association or, or composition definitions, uh, but, but we have the ability to also automatically enforce them at the database level via this concept of constraints as well. Now, to save a little time, I've gone ahead and imported and, and built a couple of other objects in the project that continue the same concept. Uh, so I've walked you through how we can build constraints that work on top of our uh, generated tables from the cloud application programming model. You can do the same thing with indexes. If you need to build uh, a secondary index, you can also target the generated tables uh, with an HDB index file as well. So nothing too different there than the constraints. 
Uh, but the other thing that I want to show you here, and I created this whole data folder, which we'll look at real quick, is I don't have to use cloud application programming model to define the, the entire data model if I don't want to. I can still use HDB table directly. Uh, for instance, I have a little part of the data model that I did not convert over to cloud application programming model. I did not need to expose it as an OData service or use it in a Fiori UI. It was totally internal to my processing. I only needed access at the SQL level. So I decided to keep it as an HDB table. And this does allow me to do things that are not part of the cloud application programming model CDS syntax. For instance, on my key field, I left this as an integer with an identity column. So generated always as identity starting with one increment by one. Um, or for instance, I have an nclob and I uh, set a specific memory threshold on it as well. So this is a uh, large, uh, large character object. I have a content and a text. I have two large character objects. And what I'm saying here is if they if they're over uh, a thousand characters to not store them in memory, but only store them as a hybrid lob on disk. So I get the ability if I use HDB table in my project, I, I get the ability to use very HANA specific features that might not be exposed and might never get exposed in the more abstracted CDS of the cloud application programming model. So it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. I can use a mixture of the two techniques uh, inside the same project. And, and a little bit later in the series, I'll even show you if I wanted to build something at the database level like this with HDB table or with a calculation view, how we can still pull that back into the cloud application programming model if I do want to expose that via OData as well. That's a, that's a topic for another day. Likewise here, I, I can build views. In, in this case, I was just building a view on top of the HDB table, but I am using the session context to automatically filter the data so it only shows me data for my user. Now, this particular view would only be uh, would only work in something that loads the session context correctly. That's also something that we'll we'll talk about a, a little bit later. The other thing that I wanted to show you is I could have still modeled the entire purchase order at the SQL level as well. And what I've done is I've just taken the, the CDS model for purchase order header and for purchase order item, and I've recreated it here in the same project with a slightly different name just so you can compare and contrast the two approaches. Uh, and what I've done here is I have, I've created the HDB, uh, as I said, the header and item as HDB tables. I've recreated some of the views as HDB views, um, even using the, uh, well, in this case, I don't, I don't think I used uh, association syntax. I'm just using the, uh, uh, I'm using uh, inner joins. Here you do see that I used a structured privilege check, however, so I'm using some of the HANA database level security. And I went ahead and I built constraints and, and I even have a uh, stored procedure here that runs on top of this. Now, of course, if I want to load some data, I have to build my own HDB table data, which we did not have to do for the CDS uh, uh, files because it built the HDB table uh, mapping of the columns automatically for us when we did a CDS build. Uh, so once again, to compare and contrast the two approaches and show you that in, in the HANA cloud and, and even when you're using the cloud application programming model, it's still possible to fall back and use the HDI sp uh, specific artifacts, uh, not only to directly access HANA level sp uh, uh, functionality, but as you see here, could use it to, to model the, the main data model. Now, I would personally do as much as I can in the cloud application programming model. And only in rare occasions, like, like I had here with this, uh, this user variance table, where I was not needing it at the cloud application programming model level, and I already had it existing as an HTTP table, and I just did not want to migrate it over and, and, and perform all the adjustments to the consuming logic. It made sense to keep it that way. 
or if I need access to HANA specific features. Um, I, do, I don't really have that situation here. My purchase order was just to, to show you the parallel uh, ability here. Uh, but if I needed some HANA specific functionality, I might drop out of the cloud application programming model CDS. But otherwise, I would try to do absolutely as much as I possibly can uh, in CDS. Uh, now I've gone ahead and I've, I've built this, to, uh, just did a uh, NPN start to, to deploy it all into the database. It is all good, so we have it there for future examples. Uh, but uh, but yeah, just to make you aware that the, the ability to do the HDI artifacts by no means has gone away and can still be mixed into our existing project. And with that, another episode has come to a close. Uh, we've now built up a really strong data model that contains all our master data and our uh, uh, our transactional data tables. We've seen how we can intermix uh, HDI artifacts directly into our project and even use them to extend our um, uh, our database objects that were generated by the cloud application programming model. In the next episode, we'll continue working at this database layer, but we're going to see some other very specific techniques involving database level um, development and how they interact with the cloud application programming model. In particular, we're going to look at how to do cross schema and cross container access, um, both from the HDI level, how we set that up in our project, but then how we can bring the, those concepts into the, the cloud application programming model layer as well, kind of do a, a reverse modeling where, where something already exists at the database level, and then we want to pull it in via, I call them proxy objects, but like, almost like fake phantom objects in the cloud application programming model CDS level. So we'll have full access all the way through our application stack up through the service and, and UI layers uh, to these other database uh, designed artifacts as well.